Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA A plus certification training course. I'm James Messer, and I'll be your host through this module on SCSI Drive technology. SCSI Drive technology is referenced in the CompTIA A plus certification requirements for test 220-601, section 1.1, where we need to understand the names, purposes, and characteristics of storage devices. We also need to know about SCSI technology in the test 220-602, section 1.1, where we talk about adding, removing, and configuring some of these storage devices. So today we're going to learn about SCSI and what that SCSI abbreviation, that odd little term we're calling SCSI, really means. We'll look at this cables for SCSI. We'll examine the interface for SCSI and the many different interfaces for SCSI. We'll look at a SCSI drive, and we'll see how it plugs all together. And we'll talk about some best practices for SCSI devices. That's an odd name, this Small Computer Systems Interface, SCSI. This is originally designed as a Small Computer Systems Interface, but it's not really small any longer. SCSI's been around for a long time. And it was really designed to be something where we can plug into one port on a system, a SCSI interface on a computer, and string many different peripherals along with it. In fact, the current standard for SCSI allows us to put up to 16 different devices in a SCSI chain. So we can have our host computer and 15 other devices plugged into this. Not many people are using their SCSI that way. But that's exactly the way it was designed to go from the very beginning. So we can have one single controller and a lot of things we just plug right on into it. There's a lot of different kinds of formats for SCSI. It's been around for a long time. So you'll hear these different formats, Fast SCSI, Ultra SCSI, Ultra Wide, Ultra 2, Ultra 640, and many, many, many other kinds of SCSI interfaces. Just remember that if you have an ultra wide SCSI interface, it needs to operate with ultra wide SCSI peripherals. Now, there's ultra-wide SCSI storage devices, for instance. And so when we start looking at these, you just want to make sure you check the documentation of your controller, your SCSI controller, and your SCSI components, and make sure they're compatible with each other. There's a number of different advantages what SCSI brings to the table. It's not just for hard drives, probably the first one. You'll find that there are many different types of SCSI devices. There's scanners. There's tape drives. Some of the very original CD-ROM drives ran over a SCSI connection. And you'll find that even a lot of these are all contained in that same SCSI controller, where I'll have a hard drive. And next to that, I'll have a scanner. And plugged into the same cable is a CD-ROM. And you'll think these are all very different types of components. But that's one of the nice things about SCSI is it puts all of these devices onto this single bus. And in a lot of ways, this simplified the installation of something that normally would be very diverse components. How do you get a scanner to talk to your system? How do you get a tape drive to talk to your system? Do I need separate interfaces? for each one. With the SCSI format, I only needed one interface. It made it very simple to add these different components into my system. It also was a very intelligent way to plug these in. The controller really took care a lot of the differences between all of these devices. It blended everything together so it was easy to manage. So there wasn't a lot of very difficult configuration work for this. Having it on that SCSI format and plugging it into that same SCSI chain really simplified the work for administrators whenever they were working with these very diverse systems. And as you'll find, SCSI has been around for a long time. Some of the very, very early PC systems had SCSI integrated into them. And the format has changed a lot through the years. It just keeps getting faster and faster and faster. So these SCSI formats, we're still finding advantages of having those SCSI formats available. And it continues to evolve through the years. Here's a SCSI interface on a motherboard that I happen to have. This is the SCSI interface here. This is a SCSI Ultra 3 interface. And this SCSI interface is, we'll look at it in just a moment in a different way, because all of the pins are really pointing the other direction on our motherboard. But right next to it, I wanted to show you, this is the interface for a floppy drive. And this is the interface for an IDE or a PADA set of drives. So you can see it's very similar in its size to those. And that's because the the interface to it itself. This one happens to have 68-pin interface SCSI on the motherboard. This is the other side of that connection. So there's a lot of pins. It's a very specific kind of connection. Notice you can't plug in a PADA drive or SATA drive into this connection. This is only for SCSI devices. There are many different kinds of SCSI interfaces. We'll look at them in just a moment. But that happens to be the one that was included on my motherboard. The cabling itself, very different as well. This is three different kinds of hard drive storage cabling I have here. On the right side, far right side, is my PADA 
or ATA or IDE drive cable. And you can see that it's this long ribbon cable, this wide ribbon cable with the red pin one that's that's marked there. And it's something that we would have plugged into our motherboard and there would be two other devices that we could string along with it. Right here in the middle is a SATA connection. We can read right there. It's the SATA cable. This is the data cable that's used. And you can see it's very small. This is one of the newer formats of cables that we have. And you can see why it's very easy to work with SATA drives inside a system because the cables are so small. It's a really problem when you get into these smaller motherboards. The SCSI cable, this particular SCSI cable, the 68 pin that comes from my motherboard, is really big. You can see pin 1 is identified with the extra color there. And you can see it's even designed so you can uh, fold it up a little bit inside of your system. And you can't see it on this view, but there must be seven other, five or six, seven other, other ports just like this along the cable because it's designed to plug in another seven hard drives coming off this single interface or seven, seven other devices. doesn't have to be hard drives, but whatever it happens to be, I can plug them all into this same cable. We're going to see that in a moment. I mentioned that the, the SCSI format has changed a lot through the years. The interfaces have also changed a lot through the years. So you may look at the back of an interface, the back of a hard drive, the back of a computer, and you're going to see a lot of different kinds of interfaces there if it's SCSI. You'll see these DB50s and the, the micro D50 female and male. You'll see a, this happens to be just a few of the different SCSI interfaces you've seen through the years. So if you see anything that looks sort of like this, chances are that it's a SCSI type of interface interface on that system. And of course, you can always grab the documentation for your hard drive or the documentation for a card that happens to be in your system, and it should give you more information about the type of connector that happens to be on those devices. There's a functionality in SCSI that allows us to plug in all of these different components into the same cable. And the way that it's able to do that is that it assigns a separate logical unit numbering to each component along that bus. So if we stick it on that cable, it's going to get a special number associated with it. Now, at the end of this SCSI cable is something called a termination. That's because what happens is we send out this signal out through the cable. And if it's not terminated, we start getting reflections back of that signal. And that creates some interference for us. So at the end of this string of devices, wherever it happens to be, there will be a termination for the SCSI. It's part of the SCSI standard. These days, the, the termination itself is often contained within the device itself. There may be a jumper that says, terminate me. It may automatically terminate when it's on the cable. But it's usually an option that's available. And it's clearly marked as this is an auto-terminating device. If you have some of the newer SCSI devices, what we call serially attached SCSI devices, they don't have any jumpers, any terminators, no settings at all on those devices. They figure it out on their own, which is really nice. If you've ever had to work with older SCSI devices and make sure every device had a different number and it was plugged into the right place and your terminator was on there, it's a lot to remember, especially when you're trying to troubleshoot and work with a, a SCSI device. These newer systems, you just plug them in and they figure it all out on their own. The way that SCSI devices plug in, especially externally, is something called daisy chaining. Also internally, here's a good example of daisy chaining from a SCSI adapter. We plug into hard, hard disk number one. Notice it has a SCSI logical unit identifier of one. This one has an identifier of two. And then on the end of the cable is a terminator so that we won't get any reflection back down the line. And that's how we chain these things up. It's called daisy chaining because it's named after, well, chaining a bunch of daisies together. And so that's exactly how you would put some daisies together to, to put those into a necklace or into uh, some type of bracelet. It's exactly the same type of format. So you often hear it referred to as daisy chaining. And I also have a picture here of what one of those terminators looks like if it's an external terminator. And you can buy these if you happen to need one for a SCSI. But usually they'll come with SCSI devices or they'll come with a SCSI adapter especially if it needs a terminator there at the end. And it just plugs in. You just have to make sure you're getting the right kind of interface for the SCSI format that you're using. Here's the back of my SCSI drive. You can see it has the standardized four-pin power connection, sometimes called a Molex connector. Here are some of those connections, those jumpers that I've got available. This happens to be a serially attached SCSI device. So I don't I didn't have to set anything to plug this into my system. I just plugged it in 
and it worked. I didn't have to worry anything about it. And there's the other end of that 68-pin D-type connection for SCSI. And again, this happens to be the one for my hard drive. If you have an external hard drive or storage device, the interface may look a little bit different. So you need to make sure that the cable that you have will plug into that type. Sometimes you'll have a SCSI cable, and it will have many different types of connectors on the cable itself so that it can support other types of cables of SCSI devices that have different interfaces on them on that same chain or that same bus of the SCSI devices. Here is a picture of how you would connect up a SCSI device. This happens to be in my hard drive and that same motherboard we were looking at before. And notice there's no power here, and all of this is sitting outside of the systems. You would never run your motherboard in your hard drive this way. I've really pulled it out so we could see it for illustration purposes. But notice I've just plugged this into the first port that's on my cable here. I've got one, two, three, four other ports on this particular cable that I could plug other SCSI devices into. And this is also a self-terminating type environment as well with this single, singly attached serially connected uh, Ultra 3 serial connection for my SCSI. So I didn't have to do anything else. I just plugged it in, and I was done. And I could have plugged it into any of these ports along the cable as well. It just happened to be which fit best in your motherboard case, in your chassis, to be able to use this in the best possible way. Some best practices for SCSI is the same best practices you have for Parallel ATA, the same best practices you have for serial ATA or really anything you're putting inside of your computer, screw it down tightly. Hard drives especially move a lot. And uh, you'll find that systems that have multiple hard drives, you actually take the entire chassis and you fasten it down in some enterprise type environments. So check your documentation and see what it recommends if you have extra so extra places to put screws when you install a hard drive, use them. It will help you a lot into the future and keep that hard drive from moving as it's sitting inside of your system. As we mentioned, the parallel SCSI is very particular about termination. So uh, the recent SCSI standards have automated a lot of this. But if you are opening a legacy system that has an older SCSI connection in it, you may immediately want to check the documentation and see, how do you terminate this? Does it have a termination on the cable itself? Does the last device on this cable automatically term terminate? Or does it have a termination that's built into the hardware of that last device? You need to check those things when you're working with some of the older SCSI devices. And if you happen to get some of these messages that pop up and say the operating system is not found, and you want to check the cables, just like any other hard drive, and make sure that it's there. The vibrations all often cause a problem with some of these hard drives. And the BIOS will tell you, and usually it's a SCSI BIOS pops up to tell you that it's found a hard drive or a CD-ROM drive or a scanner or whatever that SCSI device happens to be. And if it's not seeing it, there's a problem with that. We want to make sure the connections are good. And if the connections are good, there may be a problem with that peripheral itself. In review, we've gone through SCSI. We've learned more about that SCSI name, where it came from, and how to cable it, what the interfaces look like. And we've actually looked at a drive and how to plug it into your system. And finally, we talked about SCSI best practices and things we can watch for when installing SCSI devices in our systems. If you'd like to comment on this video, look at any of our video library for free, discuss this or any other topics in our forums or on our online wiki, you can always visit our website at freeaplus.com.